So thinking, <laughs> speaking of things in rocks that are there for millions Frogs? of years, uh, hmm. NASA just shared some really, really exciting contracts for the Artemis program. And some of them have to do with uh, using rocks on the moon and paying people to study those. So I just want to go over all of these because honestly, you this must is... be exhausted making that segue. <laughs> that must have taken so much energy. I'm exhausted, period. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, dude, I was up till three o'clock. Oh, okay. So this one is NASA's 2020 tipping point selections. So this is basically NASA uh, had solicitations to be able to do a lot of stuff, you know, uh, combined awards valuing more than $370 million. So these are decent sized contracts altogether. Um, but a lot of them, there's some familiar names in here with some really cool research that's going to be flying. So I want to talk to talk to you guys about this. The, the, the stuff that's most exciting is the cryogenic fluid management technology demonstration. And NASA didn't just say, hey, we're going to demonstrate, you know, what happens with, say, liquid hydrogen or liquid oxygen uh, on long durations, you know, long missions because they tend to boil off. Or they didn't just say, hey, we're going to try to transfer from something. They basically are paying four companies and they are... ETA Space, who will be flying with Rocket Lab on their Photon satellite bus. So we all know about this, but basically what it is, is going to be a complete cryogenic oxygen fluid management system. And it's basically going to be probably like a liquid oxygen tank on top of a photon, and it's going to be on orbit for nine months. And then they're going to try to, they have the solution that they think can help make it so the crowd, the liquid cryogenic oxygen does not uh, bleed off, you know, like does not evaporate and boil off. Um, so I'm going to, by the way, I'm going to go through these guys. Stop me if you guys have any questions while we're talking about it. Um, yeah, so that's, that's a cool one. That was a $27 million award. Uh, Lockheed Martin, you may have heard of them, uh, got $89.7 <laughs> million, which was the, the most out of these companies to do in space demonst demonstration mission using liquid hydrogen, which is the most challenging. Like that is, you know, very very cold like substantial it's, it's almost like absolute zero or darn close it's it's stupid cold uh so it's the most challenging of the cry uh, cryogenic propellants and also because it's such a tiny molecule it tends to just leak out yeah. of absolutely everything so they're they're going to be testing uh, more than a dozen cryogenic fluid management technologies positioning them for infusion into future space systems lockheed martin will collaborate with marshall and glenn on this so nasa space centers marshall and glenn um, now, the cool note here is don't forget Lockheed Martin's Lunar Lander proposal. Uh, they're part of the national team, which is Blue Origin, Lockheed Martin, Draper, and Northrop Grumman. And the lander, uh, lander and maybe even the tug, but for sure the lander relies on the BE-7 engine from Blue Origin, which is a Hydrolox engine, so a hydrogen-powered oh. engine. So, if so you're they have the BE-3, the BE-4, and the BE-7? And the BE-7. Okay. Yep, it's a dual expander cycle uh, hydrogen engine that is only in use for their lander. And then I think the tug is also going to be using it. But both of them will have to use hydrogen for long duration missions. You know, like that's that's actually, I think, a really big challenge is how do you keep hydrogen from boiling off uh, when you're in space? So Lockheed Martin is getting almost $90 million to try to try to solve that with, with a dozen different technologies, which is, I think is really, really cool. I, I thought uh, Nikola already solved everything with hydrogen. They should just call them. <laughs> <laughs> can, can they, can they push the rocket downhill? Yeah. <laughs> to make it look like it's flying through space? Hey, yeah. so, hey it's so not a pusher. Does, <laughs> how does this relate to the moon missions? Um, so just because of, uh, the, like a lot of the stuff, basically a lot of the Artemis program stuff is using cryogenic propellants and not using, yeah. um, hypergolic, like, you know, the, the Apollo missions, um, after the kick stage, after the S4B, the upper stage, put them on their TLI, <coughs> their translunar injection. After that, everything in the mission was all hypergolic propellants. And those are the ones that just ignite when they combine. Exactly. And, and they don't have to be chilled. And, and and that's the big thing is they they have a really wide range of temperature. Yeah. Uh, they don't boil off. They can be stored for years. You know, even in space, you just like long, like Voyager, for instance, Voyager 1 and 2, they, that has cryogenic propellants in it, or I mean, uh, hypergolic propellants in it, still able to fire thrusters. You know, it's, it's that storable, you know. 
Um, so by tr learning how to work long term with cryogenic fuels is definitely a, a big challenge. So the, another one that got a, a fifty three point two million dollars, the second least amount of money was SpaceX. You may have heard of them, too. Um, but what they're getting paid to do, and this is this is uh, a topic of some debate online. People go, of course, they got paid the least. Well, what they're getting paid to do is basically what they're going to be doing anyway, like 100 percent what's part of their first flight of Starship, basically. But it's going to be um, large scale flight demonstration to transfer 10 metric tons of cryogenic propellant, specifically liquid oxygen between tanks on a Starship vehicle. Now, notice that it says between tanks on a starship vehicle this is not starship to starship this is a single starship transferring between the header tank and the main tank as far as we know so literally for them that's just basically going to be opening up some valves and they will win 53 million dollars for it so <laughs> i mean in theory so yeah people can see you know poo poo and be like Oh, SpaceX didn't get any money. Like this is stuff that they're going to do on the first flight anyway, and they might just get a $53 million contract for it. So that's awesome. Um, but yeah. So the next one is United Launch Alliance um, received almost as much money as Lockheed Martin with 86.2 million. No surprise there. It seems like these two companies really know how to uh, suckle and get a lot of money. <laughs> 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 so um, they ended up, yeah, 86.2 million. But this is really exciting. This is something that we hadn't heard about for a long time. This demonstration of smart propulsion cryogenic system. Um, this used to be called ACES, uh, if I recall. And it used to be kind of its own upper stage, but it's using liquid oxygen and hydrogen on a Vulcan Centaur upper stage. So their new version of the Centaur upper stage for their Vulcan rocket, their upcoming rocket. The system will tank uh, test precise tank pressure control, tank to tank transfer, and multi week propellant storage. And ULA will be collaborating with Marshall, Kennedy, and Glenn on this. Um, this is something that for a long time one of the selling points of of, uh, of Vulcan. You know, everyone poo poos that they're not really looking at reusability too much. Well, they are because they have the smart reuse system that detaches the the engines eventually that should fly. Um, relatively soon to help it make it more cost competitive. But the they've always talked about using their upper stage, uh, reusing their upper stage by um, basically being able to hold on to the propellant lo long enough to be able to go to, like, say, say you have three missions that are all going to the same place. Well, afterwards, the upper stages can go and rendezvous and transfer propellant to each other. And you end up with like a fully fueled or partially fueled upper stage ready to go. And then that could be transferred to another mission that is a higher demand. So it's kind of the idea of like almost turning your, what would normally be a, a wasted upper stage and turning it into like a fuel depot. So it's a different type of reuse. And I frankly think it's really, really cool. So yeah, it's kind of one of those. And to me, this is one of those things that it just makes, it's not anything like, you know, I feel like what Starship's trying to do is just absolutely bonkers. You know, it's just mm -hmm. on a whole different level. Um, stuff like what ULA is proposing is stuff that is is difficult and has never really been done, but it, it, it's, it makes sense. Like it's ambitious, but it's not like, you know, ridiculous ambitious. It's just like, this will be a good idea and it makes sense, but Starship just on a different level. And that's one of those reasons why people are like, why does SpaceX always get the least amount of money? Well, they keep raising the bar. Like <laughs> everything they propose at the time seems impossible or like, nearly impossible like you know i'll give it a three percent chance of ever working type of type of idea you know and nasa wants to invest in technologies that they really it has a that has an easy path to completion or you know it has a high chance of actually succeeding and i think unfortunately spacex is just always pushing that boundary you know when they probably with one time they're like hey we're gonna land a booster i'm sure nasa was like yeah sure you are okay like we're not gonna fund that good luck you know um, but now they're talking about crazy stuff with Starship and NASA, again, doesn't necessarily believe them because it is that much more ambitious than what they've already done, too. They're just constantly pushing it. Um, so it's it's a risk management thing of like not just paying them crazy amounts for things that in their eyes might not work out so well. But um, hmm. that's not it. Then we have about what is it? Yeah, One, two, oh, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten more companies 
Um, and I'll just read them off here real quick. Alpha Space Test and Research Alliance of Houston, Astrobiotic Technology of Technology of Pittsburgh, uh, Intuitive Machines of Houston, Maston Space Systems from Mojave, California, Nokia of America Corporation of Sunnyvale, California, huh? uh, nice. PH Matter of Columbus, Ohio, Precision Combustion of North Haven, Connecticut, Sierra Nevada of Madison, Wisconsin. I didn't realize they're from Madison. No way. Uh, SSL <laughs> Robotics of Pasadena, California, and Teledyne Energy Systems of Hunt Valley, Maryland. Um, hmm. get, and then another another demonstration here for Maston for $10 million. But these ones are all more to do with landing on the moon and uh, developing in situ resource utilization. So surface power generation and energy storage communications uh, and even, I believe, working to actually develop... Um, uh, all these were power, weren't they? Uh, solid oxide. One of them I thought, yeah, oh, yeah, will generate power directly, oh, from methane and oxygen. I don't think any of these are demonstrating the ability to actually um, generate new fuel on the lunar surface yet. But um, still, I mean, some Nokia really, really cool here, stuff. Nokia creating the first 4G LTE system in space. That's pretty cool, right? I actually wonder... So, of course, 5G is the hot thing right now, but, yeah, like, part of the problem, if I understand 5G, is that here on Earth we have uh, a much more varied landscape. So, hills and canyons and those mm -hmm. kind of things. Buildings. Buildings, yeah, and those really mess with the whole millimeter wave thing. Yeah, Plus, that's, you know, that's not... Yeah, plus like a gazillion through. other devices that are broadcasting stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm kind of, I'm, I wonder, yeah, like like in space or on the moon, it seems like 5G would be even better, like or even have an easier shot than here on good old Earth. The communication system, it, in space communications could definitely use a boost. And, and you could probably do like a laser array that could even be way better than that i wonder why so nokia link. is just just trying to get it so like when me and you go up there our phones work right <laughs> that's <laughs> um, i just I imagine mean, that whatever they create will be indestructible mm. yeah i mean i'd was it the 4410 wasn't that the one that the like phone? you could drive yeah, yeah, over yeah. another oh, tank yeah. and it just keeps going yeah <laughs> but it's just just to read this this is inspired by terrestrial technology so there's like very backwards because I feel like normally it's like space things happen and then we bring them to Earth. This is uh, inspired by space te er, Earth technology here. Nokia promise or proposes to deploy the first LTE 4G communication systems in space. The system could support lunar surface communications at greater distances, increase speeds, and provide hmm. more reliability than current standards. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm, so, I'm just lost as to what the current standards in space are. Garbage. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's probably like radio... Well, I guess they're all radio. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's I was every, say it's all <laughs> everything would be a, a radio wave. Um, but yeah, like there's the deep space network, which you know, there's stuff like that. There's the um, Tedris satellites. The uh, there, I mean, or Tedris relay system. There's just, I mean, there's they're all pretty old school, old protocols, low, relatively I mean, low like bandwidth. Starlink you know? will be right there. You know, you just kind of. <laughs> That's actually something I genuinely cannot believe SpaceX didn't propose. And, you yeah. know, for a communication system is they don't need to do for the moon. You wouldn't need to do a nearly as big of a constellation. Um, you know, you're not worried about latency because you already have a second and a half delay between Earth and the moon anyway. But just to be able to provide global coverage of the moon, you could do that with a dozen satellites, you know. Well, and, I mean, you could even because the moon is locked, to, right? So it doesn't mm -hmm. like so. So it's always facing the same way. You could literally just have like stations with the phase array antennas hitting these Starlink satellites, which are actually probably pretty far from you at that point, right? They're pretty much the exact distance of Earth. So that I, yeah. I'm saying that they need to have another system You're of satellites. You're saying like just on the moon. On the moon. So you could cover and everything. Can you have satellites that, that orbit the moon? Have oh, we yeah. ever done that? We have stuff. Yeah. We have like <laughs> yeah. Joe's face. <laughs> We have stuff yeah. that, that orbits the moon now, satellites. Yeah, yeah there's like uh, lunar mapping satellites and orbiter yeah. and yeah. there's still... actually there's probably already some communication satellites because I know that the Chinese have a rover on the far side that for the first time was able to communicate. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. yep. And that was the first so, lander to ever be on the far side of the moon. Yeah. yeah. 
So yeah. Get Swifty in uh, Discord said that 4G hardware is now well understood and cheap to produce. I think that's a pretty good argument. It's like, why reinvent the wheel? Like, kind of start with what we know to set up that network, and then you can kind of iterate from there. And it'll be a vast improvement and probably a really cheap to roll out. Yeah. 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 So that's cool. I mean, a lot, just a lot of these contracts are awesome. Um, I, I'm just, I don't know. This is the type of stuff that gets me excited because we're finally seeing legit, you know, big money being spent millions and millions on, on technologies that need to land on the moon. You know, we've talked about this with Artemis and with the clips program, the commercial lunar like partnership or whatever it is where, you know, people will be landing small little things on the South pole of the moon and in preparation for humans, you know, so by the time humans go back to the moon, there'll be a litany of, of robots basically there doing all sorts of experiments already. Um, yeah, but and I should I should mention the the highest value contract in this one was the Intuitive Machines of Houston, who will develop a small deployable hopper lander capable of carrying a two point two pounder one kilogram payload more than two point five kilometers in distance or one and a half miles. This hopper could access lunar craters and enable high resolution surveying of the lunar surface over a short distance. Oh yeah, I remember hearing about that. So they could, yeah. the, the idea, I think a lot of it is also to make sure landing sites, proposed landing sites are, <laughs> they're, they're just going to take your camera there and <laughs> take pictures. I think that one of the big things is being able to, you know, ensure that proposed landing sites are, are good candidates, you know, from up close, mm-hmm. because as we know from like Apollo 11, they thought they were going to going to be landing on a, you know, in a nice smooth area and it ended up being a boulder field. But yeah. Yeah. But some of that I learned um, later on was from the way they actually didn't calculate properly a certain vent valve on the command module, and it very slightly altered their orbit enough that they didn't notice, and it you know ended up being like five or ten kilometers off from their proposed landing site because of this little tiny vent. Stuff like that. The more that. I hear about Apollo, the more I'm just like, they were insane. <laughs> like, how did they, they had they no survive? business doing what they were doing whatsoever? <laughs> it's true. It's really true. Honestly. So yeah, what I find interesting about that whole list is, I mean, I've heard many of those. Obviously, Sierra Nevada, Madston. Uh, I'm blanking now, but but like a lot of those I haven't heard of before, and I think that's really interesting that there's all these smaller companies that are now getting a, a little piece of this big project. And um, I mean, I I find like I think there's an interesting story there with all those little guys that that have started. And I don't mean to say little guys, you know what I mean. Yeah. But but who, who have started up their own little space companies and and um, maybe are focusing on one tiny little part of space yes. exploration and yeah. now are getting to be a, a part of this big thing and um, it'd be kind of cool to go around and and you know talk to some of those guys. Mm-hmm. Well, down in Houston, there's a whole bunch and I uh, this n- upcoming uh, there's. Nano racks in Houston you started off as like this little tiny company uh, and now they're growing to be a pretty big one making lots of really cool hardware I, I visited them last year yeah last year um, and they're flying this huge airlock to the International Space Station uh, on the next CRS mission for, so SpaceX's mm. CRS mission that'll be flying in the trunk this thing is like actually it's, it's interesting basically what it is is a cup that's going to attach to one of the docking nodes of the International Space Station. It's and then what they do is they open up the hatch, they place experiments <laughs> inside of this giant yes Starbucks cup. You're welcome, <laughs> Starbucks. Starbucks. <laughs> But yeah, they, uh, see, they, they've been in the game forever now. You know? <laughs> they've been Have you heard of space company ahead. called Starbucks? <laughs> <laughs> but so the uh, so this this giant thing just attaches. Astronauts can go inside, place experiments in there, and do these things. Then they close the hatch. Then the arm just grabs that cup, points it out into space, and exposes those experiments to space, or shoots, you mm-hmm. know, deploys satellites or whatever it needs to do. But say it's something that just needs to be exposed to the vacuum of space and the radiation environment for three days, it'll just hang out there. And then they can bring it back in, reopen the seal, and the astronauts then can, you know, retrieve the experiments. It's a really simple, cool idea for a for a modular airlock like that. So there's yeah, there's a lot of companies doing just cool little things that we don't always get to hear about, you know. And with all that, do they do they actually go back and forth in kind of like a bidding war, trying to like get the price down for these things, or how does it all happen? Is it just like, hey, you're the only one that makes these things? Well, this whole program is all fixed price, all of it. The commercial what does program. That mean? So, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, like, so if I'm, uh, whatever, so the, you know, they took um, proposals, right? RFPs, yeah. right? I I believe so. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, it, you know, they basically, um, they, the, the fifth competi- com- competitive tipping point solicitation and have it uh, expected combined awards. Yeah. So basically, um, and these are, by the way, these are milestone based firm fixed price contracts lasting up to five years. So, hmm. yeah. Um, so that just basically means, you know, NASA had some ideas. They were t- accepting proposals and. Yeah. yeah. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching this clip from our show. If that's just not enough for you and you want to watch the full episode, you can go to olfpod.com slash YT. And if you want more from us, you can consider becoming a Patreon member. You'll get early access to episodes. You can join our awesome community. You can actually watch us record live and get your name in the credits by going to olfpod.com slash Patreon. So thanks everyone for watching. Check back every Friday for new clips here and new episodes on the main channel. Thanks, everybody.